All right, so we're coming at you with some Zen 4 news. All the AM5 slash 7000 series stuff from AMD has, uh, for the most part, been kind of shown officially at their keynote right now taking place in Texas. Well, by the time you're watching it, it's over. But anyway, we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about why Intel better be ready to, to respond because this is starting to look like just a one-sided smackdown, if you will. Get amazing prices on the brands you love at Micro Center. Micro Center has over 30,000 items in stock, including desktops, laptops, computer components, monitors, TVs, and more. Not sure which parts to choose for your next build? Then use Micro Center's custom PC builder to find compatible parts, create your parts list, add them to your cart, and use same-day pickup at one of Micro Center's 25 locations nationwide. And if you're not comfortable building it, one of Micro Center's professional builders can build it for you as fast as same day for a fee. And if you need ideas for a build, then head to Micro Center's Build Showcase for great build inspiration, or submit your build for others to see. And right now, new customers can receive a free 256 gigabyte SSD in-store only. To see everything that Micro Center has to offer, click the link in the description below. I'm gonna be looking at my phone a lot here, um, but anyway, we'll be putting some of the, the stuff up, obviously, on the screen. So we're talking about Ryzen 7000 series, which is going to launch on their new AM5 platform. Uh, AM4 was around since 2016, so it was definitely time for a refresh. Well, there's a couple of reasons why they had to go to LGA, which is basically land grid array where the pins are on the motherboard rather than on the CPU, is because they, they needed more pins to be able to, one, take advantage of PCIe Gen 5, to be able to take advantage of DDR5, so obviously there had to be some sort of a, an upgrade there. That's one of the reasons why AM4 also doesn't support DDR5. It's because they just simply don't have enough pins in the CPU. But anyway, 1718, LGA 1718, which is 18 better than Intel's 12th gen, because that's an LGA 1700. It's kind of funny how I almost feel like some of these numbers are, are uh, well, trolly, if you will. But no, I love it. A AMD. AMD is for is, is back on top, and and, and this this keynote is just absolutely proof as to why. So it's the Zen 4 architecture, which is on the five nanometer process. It is a TSMC process. It is a fourth generation FinFET, which is basically a 3D FET technology. AM5 obviously and PCIe 5.0 using DDR5. One of the exciting things about that PCIe Gen 5 though, next gen graphics cards and such, I mean, current gen is PCIe Gen 4 right now. Um, there's really no uplift or benefit to that because we have, uh, graphics can't saturate the PCIe lanes, but what can is storage. And PCIe Gen 4 already being up to 5,000 megabytes per second read write, um, now we're gonna see PCIe Gen 5 drives coming in November of 22. So there will be just an insane amount of bandwidth and throughput when it comes to drives, which is gonna make PCIe Gen 5 itself just an amazing thing to have. Now Intel does also have PCIe Gen 5, but it's just nice to see all this latest tech taking place uh, on AMD. Let's talk about 7000 series IPC uplift or instructions per clock. So they have an average of 13% IPC uplift. And the way they come across that is they did like a, a massive test, like across the board, where they locked the, the gigahertz at four gig, kind of the, like the way we do our IPC comparison. But anyway, they locked the frequency at four gigahertz between the 5950X and the 7950X, and then the median in, uh, gain was 13%. Some were as high as 39%, others were as low as 1%. So 13% is kind of where that median gain was. And the crazy thing about that is the fact that they're able to do that uh, with a, a shrunken process. Now the TDP or the total package uh, TDP is 170 watts. So that is an uplift from the 5950X, which currently shows 105. Um, but 170 watts is where we're seeing now. And they had to uplift that package uh, power because of the fact that it is a boost of up to 5.7 gigahertz on the 7950X. Now this is something I've been saying all along and I'm, I'm so excited to see this and this is what it's probably gonna take to get me to now have AMD back at home. I never even took my 12th gen system home because there were some things I just had to do at home to get ready for it. And I knew AM5 was coming and I just really wanted to wait and see. And 12900K is an amazing CPU, but it's also extremely power inefficient. It's also extremely hot. And uh, the fact that AM5 was rumored to be greater than five gigahertz, I was not expecting to see 5.7 gigahertz on single core. Now, single core performance is extremely important for things like Adobe. Believe it or not, a lot of Adobe processes are still single threaded. So having that five point, up to 5.7 gigahertz single core is a, is a really nice uplift. In fact, that's even higher than Intel's single core uh, boost clock, which is where Intel kind of always had an advantage. And I said all along, the day that AMD can match or exceed the actual clock speed of Intel, that's where this, this 
is just absolutely becoming amazing. It's funny, we thought for sure on the current Silicon tech, just like, you know, seven, eight years ago, that five gigahertz plus was just not gonna be possible on the Silicon, the, the way that it's being manufactured. And that was true back then, obviously. But now we're down to a five nanometer process at nearly six gigahertz out of the box at 170 watts. Remember, 12900K is exceeding 230 watts stock without an overclock or anything. As for overclocking headroom, I have no idea what this is gonna be like, I can't wait to see. But a 13% IPC uplift average, and that's at four gigahertz, 5.7 gigahertz. So now you add that IPC plus all the extra clock, 1.7 gigahertz of it versus where they locked it, it, that is that is nuts. They're seeing 29% single core performance gain, and that's when you take the IPC uplift plus the clock speed into account, 29%. So the 7950X is actually the one that has the highest clocks, uh, which is kind of nice to see, because one of the things I hated with earlier Zen stuff was the fact that the farther up the stack it went, the slower the clock speed started to get, and I think that was just because of stability due to core density. But now they've got that figured out. That was the 7950X, the 7900X, the 7700X, and the 7600X. You might notice there's no 7800. Not sure what happened there. there I, I'd be surprised if they dropped the 800, but they might. They very well might drop that. But if we just take a look here at performance uplift versus the 5950X, which is AMD's current um, AM4 top dog. I mean, depending on the title, and they did all their testing at 1080p, which is great to see because you are you already know if you if you pair a fast GPU with a low resolution like 1080p, and yeah, it is kind of like low resolution. We compare 4K and 8K, obviously, but anyway, I digress. 1080p is where you're going to find your bottlenecks because the CPU has to be able to handle that high frame rate, and it's the CPU that's in responsible at that point that's going to be you know whether or not you are having bottlenecks. So in Dota 2. Not a very hard game to run, obviously, but a 32% uplift, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a 35% uh, uplift, Borderlands 3, 6%. Now, that, that doesn't surprise me. Borderlands is already very heavily AMD optimized. So the fact that they even got any uplift there is kind of nice to see. CSGO, 13%. Uh, so when it comes to computational, though, a 7950X is obviously going to be that. And it's really weird to say 7950 because that was a graphics card back when the 600 series from NVIDIA was new. So it's weird to say 7950 and have it be a CPU. 48% uplift in V-Ray render, uh, Corona render, I've never used it, 32%. Arnold renderer, 37%, and POV Ray, 45%. So huge uplift, and that's because, again, the clock speeds and the fact that the all-core boost clock on the 7950X is 4.5 gigahertz. Now remember before that was like 4.0, maybe 4.1. I was kind of hoping it was gonna be around five gigahertz on the all core, but that's a lot of cores to ask to do five gigs. So we'll have to just see what we can do once we get a chance to play around with that. Then they compared it to the 12900K and they are seeing in V-Render, V-Ray render, a 57% faster or higher score than the 12900K. That says, I mean, sure, it does have more actual cores, but the 12900K was beating the 5950X in most things. So that shows you how much Zen 4 has actually kind of moved the pendulum in terms of where that intersect and that overlap is going to be where they start trading blows. So the 7900X is a 12 core, 24 thread, 5.6 gigahertz single core, 4.7 gigahertz all core. So it's funny, I think because of the core density, they were able to, it's less cores, it's 12 versus 16. You now have one megahertz, 100 megahertz lower boost clock on single core, but a 200 megahertz all core uplift versus a 7950. It's also a 700, 170 watt TDP. Also forgot to mention, 80 megabyte cache on the 7950 and a 76 megabyte cache on the 7900. 7700X is an eight core 16 thread. So that's definitely landing more in the sweet spot where a lot of people would kind of say, okay, this is probably more than I need or good enough for future proofing. 5.4 gigahertz single core, 4.5 gigahertz all core maintaining that 105 watt TDP. So that means a wide array of coolers can keep it cool, AIOs, air coolers, uh, not gonna have any issues there with temperatures. But the 7600X, six core, 12 thread, 5.3 gigahertz and 4.7 gigahertz, 38 megabyte cache, 105 watt TDP. Now they compared the 7600X, which is their lowest 7000 series CPU, against the 12900K. Now typically what, what I say is compare price points. If you've got a $300 CPU, compare it to another $300 CPU. A lot of folks will say, well, it's you need to compare it core to core, which then you would have a very different, different price point there. AMD said, screw it. We're gonna take our lowest CPU in the stack and put it against the competition's highest CPU in the stack. And that is where it got a little bit embarrassing for Intel, as far as I'm concerned. So if we just look at Geekbench, single threaded performance, the 12900K scored a 2040, where the 7600 scored a 2175. 
So the 7600X, which is the lowest SKU currently talked about, is 135 points higher. And then the 7600X is 2225, and then 2250, and then 2275 for the 7950. And remember, that is single core. So um, that just shows you how the core, the score is gonna be directly related to the fact that the higher SKUs do have a higher single core boost. So that's where that comes in. That's kind of nuts. Um, the 7600X is a CPU that I'm definitely looking forward to getting my hands on. When we compare it to F122, 7600X, now the reason why they compared it to F122, that's not a hard game to run, especially at 1080p, that's a high FPS game, which means we're definitely seeing the CPU bound be the limiter here. And that's why they're testing 1080p. I see a lot of people comment saying, why are they testing 1080p, that's stupid. No, this is a CPU test. And so we have to create a bottleneck so we can see where the bottleneck is. And the bottleneck's higher on another one, then you know that's a better process or processor for that particular use case, which in this case, F1 2022. So the 12900K got an average FPS of 398. The 7600X, 447. So we're talking 11% difference or about 50 FPS, 49 FPS. It's very significant. A lot of people are still gaming in 1080p. So if you're playing any sort of uh, esports game or high FPS game, CSGO, you're gonna get massive FPS uplift if you're running a, a GPU that's already bottlenecked. So if you're running a, something that's currently bottlenecked on any CPU out today, and I say any CPU because the 12900K with the exception of 5800X3D was like the fastest gaming CPU you could get, and we're seeing an uplift, then you're gonna get an uplift if you're currently bottlenecked now with any CPU that's out there. But yeah, it's it's actually kind of nuts what the 7600X is capable of. 5% faster on average when compared to the 12900K. Now only title on there, remember, their benchmarks are very, I don't wanna say cherry pick, they did use a wide range of benchmarks on this. Um, the only title that it lost at all was GTA 5, but it's only 3% slower there. It tied in Cyberpunk 2077, and then up to Rainbow Six Siege, 17% faster on average which is nuts. But a lot of this they're, they're attributing to just their, their new core design. They did talk about the roadmap, the fact that they're gonna be, we're gonna see all the way up to 2024 new processors coming. They've got something called um, Zen 4C, which will be interesting to talk about. They do have X RDNA coming out, which is an SOC, which we're gonna see make its way into notebooks and tablets and probably next gen consoles. I, I personally am, am really excited about the SOC stuff because it, it, it's small form factor, but if we can get very powerful graphics out of something small, then the use case becomes very infinite in what you can do with it. People keep asking me, Jay, build a ship in a, or build a PC in a ship. Well, I can if we can get an SOC, SOC strong enough to make me not feel like it's it can play 1080p video playback and nothing else. The efficiency stuff, that's what's nuts. So when they lock the TDP at 65 watts, the 60, uh, the 5950X, well, the 7950X is 74% more efficient than their previous gen. If they compared this to Intel, this would this would literally just be like whack-a-mole. I mean, you'd just be sitting there with a big old hammer just smashing moles because Intel is not efficient at all in the least, even with the E-cores. Uh, when they go to 105 watt, which is actually the current max offering or TDP of the max offering, the 5950X, the 7950X is 37% more efficient. And then when they take into account the 170 watt TDP, it's 35% more efficient. I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of interested how they have a 2% difference there. Um, but whatever. They had to up, like I said, they had to up the package TDP because of the fact that the core clocks are so much higher and that's gonna draw more power. But yeah, that's all attributed to that five nanometer process. Um, but they're gonna be, we're seeing on the roadmap here, Zen 5, four nanometer and three nanometer respectively with Z5, Zen 5C and we got Zen 4C coming later, which I'm not too sure uh, when that's gonna be. And Zen 4 3D Vcache. I am almost guaranteeing that's where the 7800 is. The 7800, just like the 5800 X3D, the 7800 X3D is probably what we're gonna find. They find that gamer sweet spot of the Vcache, the 3D Vcache, the insane uplift when you take into account, uh, obviously, um, some a lot of the technologies that are available now between memory sharing, between GPU and CPU, it's it's gonna be insane. And they only show as far out as 2024. So one of the things I was kind of hoping to see was how long are they going to be promising support for AM5? Remember with AM4, they, they promised five years and they delivered. Came out in 2016, 2021. In fact, they delivered up through 2022. And they've talked about the fact that AM4 is not end of life, which was something I was worried about. Anyone buying a, buying a system today on AM4, if they wanted to update in the future, they would have to buy an entirely new platform. But they've talked about the fact that they're gonna continue to develop processors for the AM4, or at least continue to tweak and make better their current technology, the Zen 3 that's on AM4, which means you're not entirely end of life there. So I'd like to see some details though on how far they expect to, to run with AM5. It's interesting to me that they stuck with the 16 core 32 thread max count, which is probably good because that means they could then maintain just having two chiplets plus a memory chiplet rather than having to switch over to four, 
which is how Threadripper had started, and then that's where we ended up having Affinity Fabric and memory latency issues with gamer mode slash creator mode, and then people were having a, not the greatest gaming experience there. So sticking with the dual chiplet design of eight cores and, eight, and 16 threads per chiplet, I think was probably the right move there. You know, I, I'm constantly reminded of when Ryzen's initial announcement happened in 2016 and Intel's response of, we feel gamers and consumers are gonna adopt a let's wait and see mentality. We waited and we saw, and AMD is clearly delivering. If you're not excited about the AMD tech, um, I'm not sure, I'd really be interested as to why and definitely comment down below in a, in a civil manner why you wouldn't be excited about the types of improvements that we are seeing in AMD's technology. Rumor also has it that their RDNA 3 technology is going to do, well, they told us this back actually in 2019 when we had a meeting with them right here in our warehouse when RDNA 1 launched. They said RDNA was going to be, after several generations, was going to do what to NVIDIA what it's doing to Intel, which is a aging like fine wine and the generational improvements upon each generation are going to make up leaps and bounds or the technology gap that was always taking place between NVIDIA and AMD or Radeon. RDNA 3, they gave it a little snippet of a demo. And all I can say right now is if they can bring the fight to NVIDIA the same way they have with Intel and then surpass Intel and caught Intel with, I think Intel was just complacent. I think they had nearly 20 years of, well, about 15 years worth of AMD just having problems with CEO turnover and executive turnover and no real direction. Lisa Su came in and just not just righted the ship, but built a freaking spaceship Yamato out of the company and is just using that super gun on everything in front of it. And I want to see that on the graphics side of things. And I think we might actually see that this time with RDNA 3, which they have said is coming in 2022. guys. If you're excited for AM5, you should be. If you're an Intel fanboy and you and, and you just are having a hard time swallowing this, because trust me, I know what it feels like. I, we've, we're so accustomed to Intel being top dog for so long. And the last couple of generations kind of hammering that spike of reality into your head, it becomes hard to swallow. It, you, you don't want to see a company whose products you like slip. Guys, Intel hasn't slipped. It has fallen off of Mount Everest. While Intel's, or AMD's up top with their little flag going, are there any taller mountains around here? <laughs> you know, uh, the moon, maybe you can climb to the moon. It's a great time to be a PC enthusiast. It's a great time to be a PC gamer and the prices alone make that absolutely evident. Cause that's the one thing I haven't talked about on here, which is pricing. And let me kind of go over that real quick. The 7950X has a price tag of $699. That's a lot, yes, but do you remember how the initial like higher end Ryzen stuff had launched at like nearly $1,000? And remember how Threadripper was like $2,000? So obviously we've things, seen things improve. 699 is also cheaper than the 12900K had launched at. The 7900X 549, which if, if you're shopping in that, that high-end that high end desktop area, I think the 7900X would actually be a really good deal. 7700X 399, but that 7600X beating the 12900K in games, 299. How much is a 12900K right now? I gotta, I gotta see. $549, so it's $250 less. That is $250 extra you have to put into your graphics card in your build or somewhere else or $250 better graphics card and have a faster CPU. You gotta be excited about that. All right, guys, there you go. As more information comes and we get our hands on them, obviously we'll be testing it and we'll try and come up with as many use cases as we can think of that really actually reflects the end user. So anyway, thanks for watching guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.